Okay, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, just a quick intro. I um, just want to welcome people to the graduate student seminar series we're doing this summer. I um, want to say a couple of couple notes just to preface things, uh, right? Just despite having graduate student in the, in the title of the seminar series, attendance is, is pretty open to everyone and people's backgrounds can vary a lot. So please just be respectful to your friends and colleagues. Um, with that being said, uh, please do also ask questions. Uh, this is, you know, the primary goal of this seminar is for it to be a positive learning experience for everybody. Um, in the spirit of a usual seminar, if you have a question or you would like clarification or anything, <clears throat> uh, it's maybe just most preferable to unmute yourself and uh, politely ask out loud. Um, it's maybe the easiest way to go about things. Um, you can also just type a question in chat and I will keep an eye on it and I'll relay it to the speaker. Um, and also there will be a little bit of time at the end of the talk if you have questions that might be longer or more involved. All right, so let me just double check see we're all set. Okay, so with that being said, um, it's our great pleasure to have Nick Meyer uh, here to tell us about uh, yard splittings and trisections. So, turn it over to you, Nick. Yeah, so as I said, I'm Nick Meyer. Uh, I am a grad student at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, I'm advised by Alex Zupan. Um, I just finished my third year, so I'm going in my fourth year. Um, I kind of study low dimensional geometry topology, um, especially like combinatorial decompositions. So these are kind of my bread and butter. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about Hagar splittings and trisections, which are my two primary tools of understanding three and four manifolds. Um, so a little bit about this title slide. So this is what's called a trisection diagram, and we'll learn a lot about them later on in this talk. Um, but this is a special one, and this is a trisection of the four sphere. And hopefully by the end of this talk, we'll be able to realize how to see this. Okay. Ooh, got us scrolling this way. So some background. For the sake of this talk, all manifolds are going to be assumed to be compact, orientable. Um, we won't assume them to be closed. Um, everything is smooth and all maps are going to be proper, which just means pre-image of compact subsets of the compact. So we're going to define an n-dimensional k-handle body to be a copy of the boundary connect sum of g copies of sk cross the n minus k ball. And we'll define sigma g with a little underline below it to be the genus g surface. So that sigma zero is the two sphere. So let me draw what an n-dimensional k-handle body is. So let me add a page. So I'm going to draw everything in the n equals three case. So a three-dimensional one-handle body looks like a solid version of um, the genus G surface. So for example, a three-dimensional one handle body with three handles, I'm not put a hyphen there, three handles, looks like, so the way I like to think about it is I have a sphere, and then I attach handles to it and everything is solid this picture. So that's what a three-dimensional one-handle body looks like, is it looks like a sphere and we attach some solid pool noodles to it. And because I use three-dimensional one-handle bodies and four-dimensional one-handle bodies so much, we have special notations for them. So H upper G will be the genus G three-dimensional one-handle body, and Z upper G will be the genus, uh, the dimension four genus one-handle body. G genus G one-handle body. Lots of numbers and indices going on here. So I will not attempt to draw what Z sub G looks like. The way to think about it is look at this picture and scream to yourself, this should be four-dimensional. Um, that's really the only way I can visualize four dimensional space is by thinking it as three dimensions and convincing myself that it should be what it is in four dimensions. So here's some more handle bodies. Yeah, the, go for it. 
uh, what is the difference between the boundary connect sum and I guess like the, the usual connect sum? Yeah, great question. Okay, so I'm gonna let M and N be compact. Um, I wanna say N manifolds with one boundary component. Um, if they have more than one boundary component each, you run into an issue of, well, which boundary component are you working with? So for sake of this definition, I'm gonna have one. So I'm gonna say M boundary connect sum N is the N manifold obtained by the following procedure. Okay, so let B and B prime B N balls in boundary M boundary N. Is that what I want? Uh, I want S's and spheres. respectively. So we're going to take spheres in the boundary. So if you want to think of this in the three-dimensional case, so if you take a three-dimensional one-handle body, so this is solid, and we're picking out a circle in its boundary. Really, this is a disk. So really, we're looking at a boundary parallel disk. And we're looking at another thing so maybe we have a genus two three-dimensional one-handle body. And I pick out a circle slash disc here. And then what I do is I just identify these two discs. So you can think of it as I'm attaching a tube. So what we're doing is we're gluing in, so we're gluing in a B N minus one cross I identifying uh, Bn minus one cross plus or minus one with the disks, or really the balls. So we really did want these to be n balls. So the idea here is that we're, it looks like the connect sum in the boundary. So the takeaway here is that uh, the boundary of M connects sum N is equal to the boundary of M connects sum the boundary of N. And then away from the boundary, it looks somewhat like a disjoint union. Um, right, and the interior of M boundary connects sum N naturally is contained in the interior. Sorry, this should go the other way. There we go. That was correct. So the idea is, is on the level of boundaries, it's just a connect sum, um, but you're gluing things with a solid tube instead of a hollow tube. Um, it's kind of the manifold with boundary version of a connect sum. So here are some more three-dimensional handle bodies. Um, again, four dimensions hard. Imagine the three D picture and think four really loudly at yourself. Um, this is something my advisor told me to do, and it's what I do, and um, it mostly works, except when it doesn't. Okay. So in general, three manifolds and four manifolds are hard to picture because we can't imagine them with our tiny three-dimensional brains, um, right? Trying to imagine what a lens space looks like or right, what is the Poincaré dodecahedral sphere to look like? Um, that's, that's hard. So in 1898, Paul Hagard introduced this notion of Hagard splittings, which is a nicer way of thinking of a three manifold by reducing it to handle bodies and surfaces, because surfaces we can understand for the most part. So here are the ingredients. So M is going to be a closed orientable three manifold. 
You can also do this for non-orientable three mana folds, um, but it's a pain in the butt. Um, and you can also do it for non-closed three mana folds, so three mana folds with boundary. Um, but then instead of using handle bodies, you have to use something called a compression body, which I just don't want to get into in this talk. So Hager's splitting of M is a decomposition of M into two handle bodies, H1 and H2, such that the following two conditions hold. So first, H1 and H2 are both copies of the genus G three-dimensional one handle body. And notably, it's the same G for each H1 and H2. And the second is that these two handle bodies intersect only at their boundary, and their boundary is the entirety of the uh, genus G surface. So if we write M is equal to H1 union over sigma H2, then we say that M has a genus G Hagard splitting. And this little notation means that, I should write this in a different color. We can write this as M is H1 union H2 and H1 intersect H2 is equal to sigma sub G. So that's what that little notation means in this talk. Um, normally, of course, it means there's an adjunction. Um, and that's technically true. It's just a trivial adjunction because um, we're identifying everything with the identity map. So I want to give a pictorial definition of what a Hagar splitting looks like before I give actual examples. So if this is all of M, right? Ideally, this would be without boundary, but yeah. And everything here is going to be one dimension down. So a surface will turn into a line segment and three-dimensional pieces will turn into two-dimensional pieces. So I have some surface in the middle and then everything above it will be one of my handle bodies and everything below it will be the other handle body. And this is kind of the pictorial definition of what a Hagar decomposition looks like, is we just have some surface that divides M into two handle bodies that meet nicely. And the benefit of this is, is that we can look at the topology of sigma and look at how H2 and H1 interact. And that tells us pretty much everything we would want to know about that, if everything was nice in the world. So let's look at some examples. So a good place to start is always the n-sphere, right? It's kind of our trivial object in the category of closed four manifolds, or closed n manifolds. Here, n equals three. So we can view S3 as the union of two four-dimensional one-handle bodies, three-dimensional one-handle bodies. So these are both copies of B3, and we're unioning them across a copy of S2. And how do we see this? Well, we can view S3 in, as the one-point compactification of R3. And we'll let sigma 0 be S2, which is right naturally living in 3 space. OK. So H0, or H1 here, will just be the regular unit ball in 3 space. And H2 will be the complement of H1, union the boundary. Okay, so here's a, a way I like to think of it. So here's three space, then there's the point at infinity. I look at my unit ball. And then this splits everything into outside and inside, right? This is the Alexander theorem that every sphere in three space splits all of space. And so the blue stuff is my H2 and my red stuff is my H1. We can do this in coordinates, and we'll return to this example later. Um, so this is the idea of a Morse function, and we'll come back to this in a little bit. Well, let's take a look at another example. So now we can look at a genus 1 Hagard splitting of S3. And we can do this in the following way. 
So pick your favorite Taurus in three space. Um, preferably it would be unnamed, which means that uh, the complement of your Taurus will be a handle body. Um, so just a regular standardly embedded Taurus, such as the picture. And on the inside of the Taurus, I'll try to draw this. We have a disc, right? This whole thing is filled up. So that's the, uh, a handle body on the inside. So my red stuff is H1. My blue stuff, which is everything outside. I don't know why that disc is there. My blue stuff, which is outside. I have this single disc generator up here. And then it kind of goes out to infinity. And this kind of looks like, if you've ever seen the hop vibration, these are kind of your two orbit types here. Right, you have your external orbits, which go transverse, and then you have your stable orbits, which are kind of orthogonal to those other orbits. So the inside part here is a one handle body, and the outside, while harder to see, is also a one handle body. And here is kind of the, the handle that goes through. And then everything else is right a three ball. Okay. So that's a three dimensional picture. And this has been known since the 1890s. Um, the four dimensional picture wasn't as clear until recently. So in 2012 or 2015, depending on if you want to use archive dates or publication dates, um, Gay and Kirby introduced a what's called trisections of four manifold. Um, I'm also including references to the Meyer Shermer Zupan paper um, because they kind of expanded on the definition a little bit. And um, I'll kind of point out their contributions to this theory as well. So here X is going to be a closed orientable four manifold. Um, so within the past three years or so, there have been results for both non-closed and non-orientable four manifolds as well, stating that they exist. So a G, K1, K2, K3 trisection of X is a decomposition of X into three pieces, hence the name trisection. So there's three pieces, X1, X2, and X3, uh, which we'll usually color red, blue and green respectively, such that each XI is a four dimensional one handle body of genus KI. And looking mod three, the pairwise intersections are three dimensional one handle bodies. And the triple intersection here is a central surface of genus G. So what Meyer, Shermer, and Zupan did is they looked at these unbalanced trisections and Gay and Kirby's original paper only defined balanced trisections. So that's the case when all the Ks are the same. Implicit in the Gay and Kirby paper was this idea of an unbalanced trisection, but they never really quite called it that. So a picture of what this looks like is Here's the four manifold. And now everything's going to be down two dimensions. So a surface is going to look like a point. Three dimensional pieces are going to look like lines. Four dimensional pieces are going to look like spatial regions. So we have some central surface uh, sigma in the middle. And then we have three pieces, which are conventionally red, blue, and green. So this red guy, this is X3 intersect X1. The blue guy, this is um, X2 intersect X3. And this green guy up here is X1 intersect X2. And we usually label them, I went backwards, I apologize. 
the green guy, this is x2 intersect x3, and the blue guy is x1 intersect x2. So that this is x1, this is x2, and this guy up here is x3. And this is kind of the standard schematic of a trisection, is this disk with a Y in it. And what's cool, and I'll talk about this later if we have time, is that just like how we can understand um, a three manifold using a Morse function, which goes to a line, we can understand a trisection by looking at a Morse function that goes to a disk. And this Y picture is going to come up a bunch. So let's look at some examples. So we can look at S4, which is the five coordinates in uh, R5, that's some squared to one. So we're going to let X1 be the piece that has argument of the last two coordinates between zero and two pi over three. And then x2 and x3 are going to be defined similarly. So we're just dividing up the last two coordinates based on a unit circle. Um, and it's not too terrible to check that each xi is a four ball. So the idea here is, is that if you know what the argument of these two pieces is, and you know their magnitude, that gives you three degrees of freedom. So you have exactly four degrees of freedom and these three plus one pieces have to sum squared to one. Um, it's a really bad description of what's going on, but it's a four ball if you stare at the point set definition hard enough. Moreover, you can see that each double intersection is a three ball. So the idea here is if you look at x1 intersect x2, you're fixing the ray that x4 and x5 have to lie on. Because for example, x1 intersect x3, you're fixing it to have exactly angle two pi over three. So you can lie anywhere on that ray and then these other three coordinates are free. So you have four degrees of freedom that's sum to one. And similarly, the triple intersection is an S2. So the triple intersection is X2 because we're lying on this x4 is equal to zero piece. Um, that should not say x equals zero. They should say x4, x5 is equal to zero, zero. Is what it should say in all three of these pieces. Um, so these two coordinates are both zero and the other three have to sum to one. And then of course that's a two sphere in, uh, in R5. So this is a trisection, right? So we take- Can you say what the, the there were these, uh, this like G and the K occurring in the definition, what do those end up being here? So here, G, K1, K2, and K3 are all zero. And the theorem that S4 is the only four manifold that I care about that has a genus zero trisection. Okay, it's the only thing that you can split using three spheres. Okay, and the, the genus is the, the center, the, the triple intersection? Yeah. It's this G. Okay. Gotcha, okay. Yeah, that's usually why when I write a trisection, I, I separate G with a semicolon because it's the most important parameter. Uh, and you can kind of cycle these K1, K2, and K3 just by rotating kind of how you're viewing it. But yeah, that's a great question. So here we have a zero, 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 zero trisection, which is boring. Unfortunately, it's a little bit harder to picture other trisections. But here's one way to do it. And this is kind of where Morse two functions come in. So view S4 as living in R5 as before, and this pi is gonna be what's called a Morse two function. So this is slightly different from my picture before, 
Um, it depends on if you ask Rob Kirby or Dave Gay which way to label pieces. Dave Gay is going to tell you one way to label them. Rob Kirby is going to tell you the other. It, it, it's great. Um, mostly Rob Kirby has one out and this is the way people label them now. But we can view this exactly the same way as before. So we can just define pi from S4 to R2 by pi of X. This is equal to the argument of X4 plus IX5. And then continued to zero. So this is a continuous function um, viewed to the disk. Um, actually, you don't even have to take the argument function. This is literally just prediction onto the last two coordinates. I apologize. And then the pullback is really what you care about. So you care about the pre-images of these sectors here. So the x1, x2, and x3 sectors. And this decomposition of the disk is going to give you exactly your trisection of your four manifold. So here was just a little bit more exposition on the double intersections and triple intersections. Um, I actually gave this talk as part of an oral comp. So there were much more places in here for questions. Um, but I think it's a fun little expository talk. So one question is how do we build trisections and hangar splittings? And here is where the talk can diverge into two places. I can either talk about cut systems and other pretty pictures, or I can take a little bit of time to talk about projective spaces and how to trisect and bisect projective spaces. Um, can I ask a quick question? If you if you like up to the to the is it, is it a Morse two function? Do you just have some kind of similar condition on like critical points or something like that? Regular values. Yeah, let me, I can talk about that a little bit. Let me talk about the Morse 2 function picture. So a Morse, I'm gonna say a trisecting Morse 2 function. Um, and this is following a Kirby 15 and um, Dave Gay has this really good survey paper um, porting 3D, 4D, something. Um, if you just Google David Gay porting 3D to 4D, it's like the first archive result. Um, I think this is 18. Um, so Morse 2 function is a function um, from a four manifold to R2 such that um, at each x and x, um, I'm gonna give this name f, either f, either grad f at x does not equal zero, or f grad f, equals zero, then um, special form. And I'm going to pictorially describe what the special forms are, um, because doing them in coordinates is not fun. So everything here has to be done on local coordinates, right? You're in a manifold mapping to R2. Um, so pretend you're in suitably nice local coordinates. So the first thing is it. I guess I should use a different letter. So A, it's either definite, which just means locally, you kind of have, I'm really bad at this drawing part. It kind of looks like that. You have this critical point here. Um, or it's indefinite. But I'm, I'm being very loose here. Um, the definitions in Gay and Kirby and Gay are very 
much more technical. Um, where it kind of looks like that. We have this cone point, but you can uh, perturb it so that the cone point is transverse, right? So that if we're following this path here as we go along, right, the tangent space intersects transversely the tangent space with that bit. Oops, I guess that erased it. It's, it's, it's something happening here, like the tangent space splitting into like a positive definite and a negative definite part. Yeah, it's it's very technical, but the key thing is that all of these oopsies are convex. So none of these angles are bigger than 90 degrees, um, which helps preserve some nice geometry that goes on. Um, but that's just kind of a side. I do not claim to understand the Morse two function picture as well. Um, I just use them. <laughs> and this is really useful because it allows us to look at CP2, for example. So how do we view CP2? So there's one way that's just uh, look at homogeneous coordinates and pray, right? Try to play around kind of like we did with the four sphere and hope that we can find some nice embedded tori or higher genus surfaces that just happen to split your, um, happen to split CP2 into the three components nicely. Or we can use what's called the action map. Is that what it's called? Action. It's an action map or potential map. Um, but the idea here is right. I have Z1, Z2, Z3, and CP2. And I want to define a function that goes to R2. And how I can do this is I can do, oh boy, I'm not remembering it exactly, but it's something like z1 squared plus z2 squared plus z3 squared. Yep, this is what it is. So we're gonna send it to a plane inside R3, which might as well be and honest to God, R2 after some affine transformation. There should be norms around everything. So the idea here is we're mapping to a good old regular simplex in R3. So we have this map from CP2 and everything actually gets mapped into this unit simplex here, a one simplex, uh, two simplex. So everything gets mapped into this triangle and then we can just affinely transform this triangle to live in R2. And this is called the action or potential map and it's really useful in complex geometry, which I know nothing about. <laughs> um, the idea here is it comes from looking at it as a, uh, you can view CP2 as a torus, a, what's the best way to think of it? There's a nice torus action on CP2, um, is the way Dave Gay explained it to me one time. And this comes naturally from that torus action. Um, and then we can use the exact same tools that we did before. So I can find a central point. Um, so just like in regular Morse function, the pre-image of a point, a uh, pre-image of a regular point 
is a, well, Dakota mentioned two sub-manifold. So it's going to be a surface. And then I can just divide up. Ooh, I don't want to do it there. I want to do it here. And then I just divide up my manifold like that. And it turns out that this will give you a genus one trisection because the pre-image of one of these points is going to be a torus. Um, so this will give you a one, 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 one trisection of CP2. And it actually turns out that this same map will give you a trisection of CP2 bar just by reversing the orientation on CP2. However, it'll turn out that these two trisections are different. Well, let's, let's go back to some easier pictures and surfaces because we, we like surfaces and pictures on that. So this is gonna be the notion of a cut system, which is gonna kind of underline all of the stuff that I'm talking about. Accidentally muted myself. So a cut system is a system of curves on a surface. Um, and these were introduced by Hatcher and Thurston in a really, really, really legible paper for Hatcher and Thurston um, in 1980, where they looked at the moduli space of curves on surfaces and how that interacts with uh, the mapping class group. So let's think there'd be some genus G surface and alpha is gonna be a collection of alpha curves. Um, each alpha I is gonna be a, a disjoint simple closed curve. Then we say alpha is a cut system, right? Really for sigma. If sigma cut along alpha, which we're gonna to define to be sigma, and then we're gonna remove open tubular neighborhoods of the pieces. The idea here is, right, you can view a curve on your surface and then you literally just snip it out like it was made out of paper. And then it's a cut system if this cut along thing is a planar surface, um, which you can think of in one of the two ways. It's either a sphere with some even number of boundary components or it's a disk living in the plane with some number of dis sub disks removed. And in particular, we're looking for one that has two G components. Um, and if you're more algebraically inclined, you can think of a cut system in the following way. If you let capital A be the equivalent things in homology, then you want capital A to be a linearly independent subset of your first homology of your surface, such that the intersection form is trivial on A. Um, and by the intersection form, I just mean the natural pairing um, on H upper one, tensor H upper one, down to H lower, oh boy, down to just regular old Z. Um, given by cupping the Poincaré duals and evaluating at the fundamental class, right? The regular old thing that you would want to do with even dimensional stuff. Okay. So the algebraic picture isn't super useful because this just says everything is disjoint, homologically disjoint. So let's think of some cut systems and just kind of explore what they are. So on S2, any alpha works, particularly the empty set works, right? Algebraically, right, H1 is zero. So, you know, pick your favorite element of zero. Wow, that's a linearly independent subset. Um, or, right, pick a simple closed curve on the sphere. Okay, now try to pick a different one that's homotopically disjoint from it. Well, no, you can't, you can't do that. 
What about on the torus? So what are possible cut systems on the torus? Well, here's one, right? I can cut it along the wrong way to cut a bagel. And I can think of this and unwrapping and that gets a tube and then I thicken it up and that gives me a surface, uh, a sphere with two punctures. And the same idea works in every genus. So on genus two, I just cut the bagel wrong twice, unwrap it, and I get a pair of pants. But it actually turns out that this piece, this piece, and another empty piece that looks like this but upside down are the only pieces you need to build any cut system up to some notion of equivalence. So lemma Sorry, on the on the standard torus, is there any is there any choice of curve which doesn't work? Like if you choose something homologically trivial or something? Um yeah, anything that's homologically trivial won't work. So if I chose, for example, right, this disc here instead of the red curve and I cut it out, well, that's not going to separate my surface into a planar surface. Does that make sense? Yeah, what, what did you need for planar surface again? This is a sphere minus points or disc minus points? Uh, I couldn't quite hear you. What was the, uh, the, the planar surface condition? One of them I think was a, a, like a punctured disc, right? Yeah. Yeah, planar surface, punctured disc, or sphere with some boundary discs. They're all equivalent um, notions. Okay, okay, gotcha. And the kicker is we need this planar surface condition. Okay, so let's, let's prove that cut systems exist. Because a priori, maybe on some crazy high genus surface, you can't find a complete collection of curves. So the lemma is that they exist and they have exactly G curves. We're gonna do this by induction. Well, I already showed the G equals zero case. It's trivial, right? Pick the empty collection. And the genus one, well, T2 itself isn't a punctured sphere but cuddling along this red curve works. So for genus two or more, sigma G breaks down into pieces of the following form. There's the piece A, which I call left macaroni. There's piece B, which is a topologist's t-shirt. And then there's piece A prime, which is right macaroni. And if you're willing to believe me, then sigma G breaks down into a left macaroni, G minus one copies of a t-shirt and one copy of right macaroni. And we just blew everything like Lego bricks. And we can describe a cut system on here as follows. So on A, we're just going to cut the macaroni noodle in half. In part B, we're going to cut along the midsection of this t-shirt thing. Or if you want to think of it as weird pants, we're cutting the pants in half. And on A prime, we're not going to put any curves. So if I do everything like this, I get a cut system that looks like this. And this is on sigma sub g or sigma sup g. And the colors mean nothing here. They're just to denote what piece it came from. So we have a red cut here and then a bunch of blue cuts. But how do we see that this gives us a planar surface? Well, we can take our scissors and cut all the way along here and cut out this entire thing and then we kind of unbend it. And we get this thing that looks like a flute. Right? We have two open end bits bounded by the red curves, and then we have two G minus two finger holes. Okay, 
And this, of course, is a punctured sphere with two G-holes, right? If I really wanted to, I could blow up this piece and kind of make it more spherical. And then you would maybe see a little bit more clearly that this is a sphere. So taking alpha to be the red system union, the blue system, this gives us a cut system. So how do we see that we can't have more or less than G curves? Well, if we had more than G curves, cutting along it, we'd have more than two G boundary components. And if we had less than G curves, we wouldn't have enough boundary components either. So one notion that is definitely worth talking about is equivalence of cut systems. So when are two cut systems determined to be the same? So a definition, the standard genus G cut system is this one. It's just you snip all the bagels like this. We see that two cut systems are diffeomorphic. If there's an orientation preserving diffeomorphism on the base surface um, and a permutation in the symmetric group on G things such that phi of alpha I is beta of sigma sub I for some um, beta J's and beta. Right, there's just a diffeomorphism that sends one thing to the other. So for example, on the torus, these two cut systems are diffeomorphic. Um, and it's orientation preserving because we can view it in C2 and this map Z1, Z2 to Z2, Z1 is orientation preserving by counting transpositions. Right, so this thing moves two spaces, this moves two spaces, that moves two spaces and that moves two spaces. So everything is even. So that's what it means for two cut systems to be diffeomorphic. There's also a slightly weaker notion of equivalence called slide diffeomorphism, which is technically what everyone uses in real life. But it's a little bit more complicated because you need to slide curves over other curves and it's, it's, it's a bit of a picture nightmare. So a genus G Higgard diagram is a triple sigma alpha beta, such that alpha and beta cut systems for sigma. And conventionally, alpha curves are always drawn in red, beta curves are always drawn in blue. And moreover, these cut systems have to satisfy a standardness condition, right? Each pair, sigma alpha and sigma beta, have to be diffeomorphic to the standard genus of sigma cut system. So what is something that these look like? Well, on the sphere, here's a, a great Hagar diagram. It's the empty Hagar diagram. And this is a Hagar diagram for S3. Because we can view these as telling us how to glue in handles. The red curves are going to tell you how to glue in one handles. And the blue curves are going to tell you how to glue in two handles. Um, I'm not going to go over handle calculus today because I have like five, six minutes left. And that's definitely not enough time. But here are three genus one examples. And I'll, I'll label these by the three manifolds that these come with. So this guy here, this is S1 cross S2. This guy is still in S3. And this guy is going to be a lens space LPQ for some values of P and Q, um, where PQ is the representation in the natural basis of H1 of your blue curve, um, where P is your lambda coordinate and Q is your mu coordinate, where here mu is that curve and lambda is that curve. So the way I remember it is lambda is longitude. That goes the long way round. Mu is the meridian. It goes the meaty way. I like to think of my torises as thicker around the midsection. Um, so as I kind of mentioned, Hagar diagrams yield Hagar splittings. And the idea is that the cut systems tell us how to build the three-dimensional one-handle bodies by specifying what curves bound disks. Um, and then this was a picture um, that kind of showed how the genus one thing was built. 
Okay. So now we're going to go up to trisection again. And we see that the standard GK Hagar diagram is a triple sigma alpha beta of in the following form. So the alpha curves are all these standard pairs. And the beta curves, k of them are parallel to alpha curves. And g minus k of them intersect alpha curves in exactly one spot. Um, when we get to the definition of a trisection diagram, this will hopefully become more useful. So an example, a three, one standard Hagar diagram is this picture. So one of our blue curves is parallel to a red curve, and then the other two intersect transversely in exactly one plane. So the big idea is that alpha curves tell us how to build H1, the beta curves tell us how to build H2, and the standardness condition is required so that we can build the union in a nice, smoothly defined way. And a theorem, and this is pretty classical, if N admits a genus one Hagar splitting, then M is diffeomorphic to one of the following three families. It's either S3, S1 cross S2, or some LPQ for co-prime integers P and Q. Okay. I'm gonna skip over handle slides because we just do not have time. And I'm gonna get to the trisecting picture if this ever loads. Okay, so a GK1, K2 trisection diagram, um, or more succinctly, Hagar Kirby diagram. Um, and this is following Meyer, Shermer, and Zupan, their uh, 2018 paper, is a quadruple sigma alpha beta gamma such that sigma is a genus G surface, alpha beta and gamma are cut systems on sigma, such that each triple is slide diffeomorphic to a standard GK um, Hagar diagram. So pairwise, these things bound three manifolds, right? So on each boundary three manifold, we want to have a Hagar splitting. And so here is an example of a Hagar diagram. This is a 1100 trisection diagram. Right here, this one, this tells us the number of intersections of parallel curves, I should say, in x1 intersect x3, and this is x1 intersect x2, and this tells you how many parallel curves you have in x2 intersect x3. Um, the notation is a little bit cumbersome because the genus and um, reverse. The notation is a little bit cumbersome because you're tracking parallel curves rather than curves that intersect. So here you see when we look at red green, so we ignore blue, we have one family of parallel curves. Whereas we don't have anything in the other two families. And this is actually a trisection diagram for S4. It's called the two, uh, the one-fold stabilization. So this is a one-stabilized trisection. So lemma is that the trisection diagrams tell you how to build trisections. Um, and the idea is you can build each of the three-dimensional pieces exactly like we did in the three-dimensional case. And then we can use this super celebrated theorem of Lodenbach and Ponaru, which says that if you know essentially the zero, one, and two handles of a four manifold, there's a unique way to complete that and cap it off using three and four handles. Um, and it's unique up to diffeomorphism. It's, it's an incredible theorem. Um, I don't claim to fully grasp everything it can do. But it's, it's one of these results that just 
revolutionize the field because now we can use all these geometric techniques. Um, and this was back in like the seventies, I think. Um, and so theorem, and this is from uh, Jeff Meyer, Trent Shermer, and Alex Zupan. Um, if X admits a genus one trisection, then X is either S4, CP2, CP2 bar, or S1 cross S3. And all three of the Ks are equal, or X is S4, and the triple of Ks is some permutation on one zero zero. And that's, that's it. That's the idea of Haggard splittings and trisections. I could probably give another two hour talk on more details, but I just kind of wanted to give an overview of what the heck these things were. So uh, thanks. Oh yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, let's, uh, let's go ahead and thank Nick for his uh, wonderful talk. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, does anybody have any questions? One, one thing I was kind of wondering from earlier, it's, it's not a huge deal. I think it was in the proof of uh, existence of these cut systems. Um, you had these sort of the, the pieces, like the two, two different pool noodles and then the t-shirt, right? Mm -hmm. uh, are, they, are these just coming from like, like the, the elementary cobordism sort of decomposition when you attach a Morse function in like, I forget how it goes, like you take sub-level sets or whatever? So that is one way that I thought about it. The easiest way is to honestly just think combinatorially of how would I want to build such a thing? Um, so I, I like to say I, I study Lego brick topology. I like to think of myself as I have a standard toolbox of pieces. What are all the different ways I can glue them together and give me something interesting? So Hatcher Thurston proved this well, actually in their paper, they didn't prove that they exist. They just said, well, clearly they exist. And um, I think it was giving worth giving a cool little proof for why these things have to happen. Um, and what's actually even cooler is that if you're allowing non-orientable stuff, similar cut systems can still exist, but they might cut up to give you punctured Mobius bands rather than punctured annuli. Um, and that gives a whole bunch more difficulty as well. But yeah, the, the, these pieces really just came from thinking about what would have to happen and what is this, the easiest thing I can do to guarantee a cut system. Because right, I could have chosen just crazy curves on my B's or my A's. Um, so for example, if on my B piece, I wanted to choose this curve, well, if I compressed along these curves, right, I cut these out, that's gonna separate, those are separating curves. And that's, that's not really what we wanna do. We don't want to separate. We want to keep everything intact. I see. So, so these are kind of coming more from casework on kind of like all the different cut systems you, you could dream up. Yeah. And that's, and that's kind of the thing I like about this way of approaching topology rather than approaching it from the, the Morse theory land or approaching it from thinking about surface bundles and crazy highfalutin differential geometry is we really get a handle on exactly what you need to build a manifold and how much structure and information you need to specify a manifold up to diffeomorphism. And it turns out that cut systems from a combinatorial standpoint are pretty much the bare minimum. Do you, uh, do you happen to know how or how or if like the, the curvy calculus stuff ties into this or is this like are these two sides yes. of the same coin or something or? Yes, 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 I do. Okay. 
the idea for the Kirby calculus goes through the Morse theory land. So by knowing a trisection diagram or a um, Hagar splitting diagram, you're able to get a handle decomposition on your manifold. And that handle decomposition works in the following way. So let me scroll all the way down to the bottom. So right here is kind of your standard picture of a four manifold. I'm just gonna draw it as a box. So here's X4. So uh, a lemma of Morse or probably Milner says that you can build it with a unique zero handle and a unique four handle. So your zero handles and four handles are uniquely determined. And by construction, we know that X1 is a four dimensional um, one handle body. So I can just put X1 into this picture. So here's up to my one handles and this piece down here is X1. So X1 is my zero handles union with one handles. And if I kind of turn my head upside down, I can do the same thing with X3. So X3 is three handles and four handles. So here is X3 up here. And the tricky part is how do we fill in the middle bit? Is how do we make these things match up? And this was the real innovation from the Gain Kirby paper is that, okay, well, let's ignore this stuff up here. Let's not even pretend that this stuff up here exists. So I'm just trying to build a handle structure now. Well, I can specify how I'm attaching my two handles, right? So I have X2. And I can tell it how to attach here onto the one handles. And this gives me a link with a framing. And this framed link is exactly what you need for a Kirby calculus picture. And so I take X2 and I glue it in here. And then I do the same thing up here. And I just kind of flow along a little bit, keep doing X2, and then I see what link I have to glue in here. And what Gay and Kirby showed is that it's the same link with the same framing more or less. Um, so essentially what we've done is this, and then I have X2, and then this stuff here is just whatever we need to glue in with Lovenbach and Bunnery to cap off the picture. Um, and nine times out of 10, it's just a four ball. Um, it's been a while since I've looked at the original Gain Kirby paper to fully understand this construction, but this is pretty much the schematic picture is that you get three layers and then you kind of fill it in. And really the picture most people look at is this one. where you kind of let X3 flow a little bit. So it also hits X1. And then this thing here, this triple point is your central surface. Um, that's kind of the more theory picture. And by adjusting this to be two dimensional, you can get a Morse two function. Cool. cool. Yeah, Kirby Everybody... calculus appears naturally uh, by gluing in these links. Any other, any other questions? All right, so let's go ahead and uh, thank Nick one more time. So, thanks. Thanks, Nick. Awesome, thank you, everybody. Go ahead and stop the recording here. Yeah.